How do you know how much money you need to save if you don't know how much you can take out? Right. All retirement plans will work. It's just for how long will they work? Right. The minute that we stop being curious about how something works, the out, there's no way for the outcomes to get better. We haven't seen this before and the results you're getting are really good. I've got to share this with, with other people. I think a good place to start first and foremost is to thank you for not only hosting the recording of this episode, but being on the show to discuss the portfolio waterfall. It's an honor. Yeah. Hey, it's great to meet you finally in person. Mm -hmm. And I really appreciate your work in highlighting the portfolio waterfall and the, the work that we're trying to do. Uh, you know, when I first met you, I knew that um, you were someone that was trying to find the truth and really show people like how things worked. And that was the thing that, you know, the reason why we wanted to reach out to you, uh, you know, after the, the video with Dave Ramsey and, and it was really thankful to Brian in our office is like, Hey, we need to talk to this guy because if he's wanting to know about withdrawal rates, this is what we are spending all of our time on trying to figure out how to help people get more money out of their retirement accounts in the safest way possible. So, and I, really I found, I found the work to be inspiring. And I came into it with a little skepticism as we do with everything, but an open mind. And I, I am simply blessed to have gotten to explore the portfolio waterfall and to have conversations with you leading up to what was episode 80. For those of you listening, if you haven't heard episode 80 of the Hopefield Financial Podcast, that's where we first touched on the portfolio waterfall. And moving forward through this interview, we're going to be covering some questions on the background of the portfolio waterfall. We're going to be covering some technical questions that came yeah. out of that episode, and then some personal questions that are going to go a little bit more into our philosophy about money. You mentioned something about skepticism, and mm -hmm. I think that's something that people should have. So, someone a long time ago told me, you know, when you first meet someone, especially when it talks about money, I think it's okay to maybe not trust them and maybe just assume that they're an idiot and they don't know what they're doing. And then see if they prove you wrong. And I think with that mindset, it can, you can see it maybe at first kind of negatively, but it's actually, I think it's positive. So like, then you're curious about the conversation. And is, is this person speaking from opinion or fundamental truth? And I think that's the reason why you're here. Well, and that's, it's that pursuit of truth that actually inspired the Dave Ramsey episode and really got me into withdrawal rates because I was trying to prove Dave Ramsey right. When I went through his financial coach master training and his other stuff, I saw it and I saw this 8% and I'm, everyone else seemed to contradict it. So I set out to prove him right, proved him wrong. And that set me on the mission to make the episode I did in September and then call his show and then ultimately meet you. Yeah. So what was that, what was not lining up just because everyone else was, you know, showing a number that's much smaller. Or is it because you you had some proof behind this? It's like, there's no way this is right, so I need to, need to at least go to the source to try to correct it. Well, the some of the best advice I've ever gotten is not to invest your time or your money in something that you don't understand. So I wanted yeah. to seek understanding. In my own personal financial journey, I just finally hit the point when this kind of started that I should really focus on investing for retirement. And... And going down the path of, okay, I got a 401k, I have my Roth IRA, I'm putting money in it. How do I turn that into income? I didn't know what Dave Ramsey's actual position was at the time, but I had followed him and his opinions and teachings on debt had been very helpful. Yeah. So when I found that he had an 8% safe withdrawal rate item in his books and in his works, I started saying, well, is that right? And I found contradicting sources. And I went, someone has to be right, someone has to be wrong. So how do I find who, who's right or wrong? I, that's when I started modeling Monte Carlo simulations and then trying to build different models with spreadsheets in order to find the truth. Yeah, I think more conversations need to be had about withdrawal rates. Because if you're someone in the accumulation phase, how do you know how much money you need to save if you don't know how much you can take out? Right. It's, a, it's one of the most important questions. When I, talk, yeah, when I talk to someone about money, specifically retirement, I always start by asking, how much money do you need to retire? Sometimes I get, I don't know, 
That's probably the most common answer. I don't know. No, I'm just saving for retirement. Every once in a while, I will get someone who says, it's, it's more than you think. And I'm like, well, give me a number. And they actually hit within a proper ballpark. Yeah. And I go, how did you get to that number? And then they backtrack. And I'm like, you've put some good thought into it. This is good. Now I know where you are. Yeah. So I think one of the other major you know, things that need to be talked about more is retirement planning has very little to do with math. I would mm -hmm. say maybe 20% of it is math. So the people that are good at retirement planning are not necessarily the ones that are the best at math. So I always kind of look at, we we're talking about Dave Ramsey and mm -hmm. is how did someone get into debt? Is it because they're bad at math? No, it's behaviors. It was a pattern right. of behaviors. So if that's true, then investing for retirement and being successful with that is more about a pattern of behaviors than just being good at math. And I think a lot of the people that maybe will go against the portfolio waterfall or try to really, it's all math focused people and not behavioral focused people. And I think how a financial advisor can help someone the most is by focusing on the behavior and less on the math. Well, and I think a lot of poor decisions come out of fear or not understanding. And a good financial advisor can really help their client quell that fear, false evidence appearing real, when it is something that they don't need to be scared of, or it's simply a different approach needs to be applied than what they might do emotionally or behaviorally. Yep. All retirement plans will work. It's just for how long will they work? Right. So the root problem of retirement, or really financial planning in general, it's, it's a time problem. And I'm convinced through my experience is everyone has a skewed view of time. Okay. So I think I'm getting close to that pivot point. Um, I'm in, in my 40s and you know, up until this point, I thought I was gonna live forever. And then now I work with 70 year olds and think there's no way that this person thinks they're gonna live to 80. I was like, no, you're probably gonna live to, you're in good health at 70, you're probably gonna live in your 90s. Right. So the skewed view of time that's really a core issue. So how can we solve time and, and have confidence, right? right. That confidence and peace. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. So if you're sitting there in retirement and you're watching the news and you see your, your account balance going up and down, there's no, and you don't quite understand what's really going on inside of your plan, then you're gonna you're gonna pull out. I mean, and, just and, recently in the news, the the drop that happened. I mean, it's yeah. gonna be well in the past now when this airs, but there was a drop and everybody was screaming doom yep. and gloom. This leads me to a question: How did you get inspired to find the portfolio waterfall and then go about sharing it? Because you mentioned that it's a lot of the the very math focused people who seem to make arguments against the portfolio waterfall. But my work in episode eighty showed some very good mathematical backing for the portfolio waterfall. Was it behavior? Was it math? Yep. Well, what inspired you to follow, follow this path and do what you've done? I did not set out as an investment advisor to try to create a new retirement strategy. It was not it. Uh, a client, a retirement client hired me to do one thing, to help them to not run out of money. They were a conservative investor. So we couldn't make huge risks and their need, this was just a want, their need was much higher than a 4% withdrawal rate. Mm. And I, I felt like I couldn't just, you know, say, well, we're just going to hope for the best and do the traditional, you know, rebalance and provide a distribution. So then I went back and like, so why, why is it 4%? Why is it not 6% or why is it not 2%? Why is it 4%? How does it fall apart? What are the fundamental things? So this at the time, I didn't really know, but I was practicing reasoning from first principles. Boil it all down to the root thing. The first thought was, how would we just stop selling shares? Is mm -hmm. there a way to collect cash flow and not sell shares or minimize the selling of shares? So luckily there was a software to advisors that was free mm -hmm. and is still to, the, to this day, that is probably one of the only softwares that I know that we can fundamentally show and improve the portfolio waterfall with any type of mutual fund. Mm. And every time I did it this other way, so stop rebalancing, stop doing pro distributions, 
and had control over where we took withdrawals from and how cash flows flowed in the portfolio across the total return. So appreciation, dividends, capital gains, and interest. So every time I did the, the method of the portfolio waterfall now, it worked way better. And at that time, with that fund selection and going back you know, 20, 30 years, I, it wouldn't break until I hit about 9% withdrawal rate. And the client was needing between, you know, a starting withdrawal rate of 8%. Mm. But you think if we have a little bit of a drawdown, now you're, now you're talking 12% withdrawal rate. So that was November 14th, 2014. Mm. So I did not have any idea that this would ever be, I was just thought I was trying to help my client not run out of money. What's interesting is I, I shared, a, shared the whole idea with a couple of people and they're like, ah, oh, that's just another rebalancing strategy. That's really nothing. I kept it all to myself until 2019. Okay. So looking back, you know, so 2019, 2020, that's where COVID was happening. Market went way down or, you know, had more time on our hands. And I was going back through our accounts. It's like, man, this client that we put this retirement process together called now called the portfolio waterfall, it did way better than all of our other accounts. And at that time I was like, I need to have someone else review this just to see if it's a thing or not. At the time, I had the, a really good relationship with one spe specific fund company and the CFA department, they had you know, several CFAs groups in this major fund company. They came back like three different times and then basically came back and said, yeah, we haven't seen this before and the results you're getting are really good. And there may be a, some anomaly that we can't see you know, 30 years from now that might be appearing, but you should run with it and, and go with it. So here I am, I'm just a, in the financial world, a very small individual in the middle of nowhere, Nebraska. And this guy just said, we have a strategy that we haven't seen before and you should go run with it. I'm like, really? So at that time, I, my next phone call was to our compliance department saying, hey, this just happened, what should I do? And I told them what happened and, and they said, no, we'd, we'd love to, highlight this and that was the start of where we are, how we got to where we are today i had a major other fund company and they were there for one reason mm. to show that i was totally wrong like this who's this guy in nebraska that thinks he has something and we're just going to blow him out of the water mm -hmm. and on that call there was 12 people we had the head person from every distribution channel globally an actuary and three cfas and when I made it through that, I was like, I've got to share this with, with other people. And that was how it happened. That is a wonderful story. I thank you so much for sharing the history behind the portfolio yeah. waterfall there. I am personally inspired hearing that. As we're talking about it, I want to know to you, what is the single most important defining factor of the portfolio waterfall that sets it apart from anything else that any, anyone in your story had seen before. So I think the biggest takeaway for a client is it's understandable and it makes them feel like they have control. It's not this thing where we're just going to put it in the stock market and we just hope that it works out. I think everyone's probably heard of the sequence of returns risk. They're like, I hope it works. We're just going to roll the dice, but the portfolio waterfall and how we explain it and the tools that we have, we can show someone, what does a mutual fund or ETF look like on the inside? Mm -hmm. I think the industry has done a really bad job of showing people what things look like. Like how does it actually function? Because you don't get that explanation on your statement. It, that's for compliance things only, uh, regulations. But actually educating the client of how does this actually function on the inside? And when they can see how a mutual fund or ETF functions and what we have control over, that gives them hope that they don't run out of money and they at least know what to keep their eye on. It's gotta be so rewarding to see the light bulbs click and see people as they grasp the understanding, find a sense of contentment for yes. their plan. Clients are much easier to explain this to than other financial professionals. Fascinating. And the only thing I can come to the conclusion on is clients don't have as much stuff in their 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 head with all this clutter of financial jargon and well what about this that is they come with a clean slate once they 
they trust me and they get it immediately. Sometimes an advisor or another financial professional takes two or three times of explaining how it really works before they get it. And that's another really fascinating thing, but it's the clients that really keep this moving forward. What is the single biggest hurdle that you've had to overcome or are working to overcome in sharing the portfolio waterfall? The biggest hurdle I have is sharing this with other financial professionals. And I am super fortunate to have a broker dealer and RAA that supported me. This could have been squashed from the get go. I think they saw the principles behind it, that this is not just an opinion, but if we can help people do things from a standpoint of fundamentals and they can see their accounts in different ways, that that is helpful to the, to the general public. Mm -hmm. But the biggest hurdle is other institutions because their whole platform was built around the traditional methods. I have other advisors that say, well, well, how come another firm hasn't come up with this? Mm -hmm. And I'm convinced that they did. But you can imagine like a, a really smart CFA come into the boardroom and say, hey, I just figured out a more efficient way to have money leave the firm. That, okay, that new idea, we're, we're going to squash that one for now. Love the enthusiasm. No, that's not going to happen. And really wealthy people can afford a really crappy financial plan. They, they don't have a 4% problem. That's right. There's, there's this bizarre irony where the people who can afford advisors and large firms the best <laughs> are the ones who can withstand the worst plans and those who need the advisor the most are the ones who can't afford. Yes. Un unfortunately, the industry is built around a lot of the higher net worth, not mm -hmm. general public. So I think there's things are starting to change, mm -hmm. but that's the hurdle of like trying to convince a company to change their method for this one guy in Nebraska that's telling we need to do this. Mm -hmm. That that's been tough. So what I'm going to dive into now are some more technical questions that came out of my production of episode 80. So I shared the portfolio waterfall, I explained it to the best of my ability in that episode, and I got some really good comments back. And one of them may necessitate a revisiting of the portfolio waterfall in a future episode. There was a question about where an expense ratio from a mutual fund comes from when you're exercising the portfolio waterfall. Does it necessitate selling shares, pro rata? Does it come from the NAV? Does it come from the cash that's generated? And by extension, where do advisor fees come out of? Is there a specific area you're able to control or is it sort of imposed upon you? So an expense ratio on a mutual fund actually is not a charged expense. So it's not like you're gonna see that on your statement where it's like, here is a your mutual fund charged expense. It just comes out of the return. So that's something really important for people to know mm -hmm. that it is a not a charged expense. In a way it is, it's just, but it's already coming out of the return. Right. Uh, now you have like custodial fees or advisory fees from your financial professional. That is a charged fee, most likely coming out on a quarterly basis, along with institutional fees, a, a custodial fee, a Schwab or whoever you have your money at. That is a charged fee. Um, but an expense ratio, that is just coming right out of the return. And it's typically tied to what's happening. So I don't know, I, all people, you know, a lot of people are like, I want the cheapest fund. It's like, all right, well, they're charging you to, to do something. So if you want low cost, that means there's less stuff happening behind the curtain. So yes, there's some areas you do like that maybe have some lower cost, more like an index type mutual fund. But some other categories, we're okay with fees as long as you're getting something for it. When you're working with an advisor, you're typically buying institutional shares. So we're buying it as a, at a discount. So yes, there's an additional fee for an advisor, but also there's some ways to recoup that by buying institutional shares. Okay. So when you say come, the expense ratio comes out of the return, yeah. right? are we talking about the growth of the shares and it comes out of that? Or are we talking about the, the dividends, interest, and capital gains? or collectively among collectively these. of the total return okay does it does an expense ratio get this get taken out evenly across them what i'm trying to really understand is when an expense ratio 
not being charged, but it's being taken into account, is it resulting in the sale of shares that are outside of your control? No, no. Okay. So that's not the, the only way that the only thing to be kind of tied to that would be a the turnover ratio. Typically, a higher turnover ratio is going to equal a higher expense ratio. Okay. So those kind of go hand in hand. If you saw a really high turnover ratio with a really low expense, that's probably a machine making those decisions. Okay. Uh, which that probably doesn't work well, at least at this point in history. But there's not like at the end of the day, there's nothing wrong with a fee as long as you're getting something for it. But it's not a charge. Like let's say uh, you bought an A share mutual fund. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a charge. Like you got charged immediately when you bought that thing. Right. If you bought a C share, well, if you bought if you sold it within 12 months, you're going to get an exit fee on the way out. The expense ratio is as an annualized taken out equally out of the return mm -hmm. over an annualized period of time. Okay, very good. Thank you. I came across this mentality before meeting you. Uh, ben Felix actually has a couple of videos on this on, on YouTube. It's dividends actually don't matter. And what I got from investigating that was that if a, a dividend is paid out, then it's effectively reducing the net asset value of a given company that's paying the dividend. Or you could have a company that doesn't pay a dividend and it'll simply appreciate more. So dividends don't matter. But the portfolio waterfall focuses on the distribution of dividends in order to have a replenishing strategy versus a consumption strategy. Well, where do you stand on dividends not mattering and how would you respond with how dividends play into the portfolio waterfall? That is a bold statement to say they don't matter. Agreed. In what context do, do they not matter? So usually always when, when a, another financial professional starts to maybe attack the theory of the portfolio waterfall, it always goes back to two different things. It's fees and performance. Mm -hmm. So if the stock market went up every year, would you ever use the portfolio waterfall? No. No. Well, the market's all over the place and dividends do matter. So you could say portfolio waterfall, we have dividends, capital gains. This is a total return. It's a multi-asset total return approach. So you could say, well, you're, you're still consuming because you're consuming dividends, which NAV goes down. Well, how do you get a dividend? Like, what's that based on? It's actually based on, do you own a unit? So if you don't have that type, you have uh, no dividends, but you are, you're, a, you're, a perform, you're what we call the outperformer. You're going to think you're going to outperform, and that's why you don't want any of these other additional things like dividends, um, or low, low, low turnover ratios, and you're just going after performance. Well, then you have to consume for income. And, but your, your theory is you're going to outperform. So that's never a problem. Right. Well, if you don't sell your mutual fund, do you ever run out of money? Unless the mutual fund becomes worthless now. So it's not guaranteed, but are we helping someone to not run out of money? And when someone hires me, it's for one job primarily. The initial job. Never run out of money. So when we accomplish that with certainty, now we can do some other really cool things. So it's not like, hey, we're, we're forcing everyone's money into this one strategy and that's it. Mm -hmm. Like, no, once we have income satisfied, now we can go do some really cool stuff. So we can do some other things that really get performance. But a lot of people in the financial world, it always goes back to their performance chasers. And that mentality of performance chasing makes dividends feel like they don't matter, but you made, made a really good point. Dividends are tied to if you own a unit. They're not necessarily tied to the net asset value. The yes. The number of shares that you have of or units. With that, what I discovered is when I tried to make my model for the portfolio waterfall, I tried to tie the standard deviation, the variation in dividend production, capital gain production, and interest to the net asset value. What I found is that then matched every other traditional strategy. When I go back and I tie it to association with units, I believe the standard deviation for the different cash productions varies and it is smoother, the yes. variability is smoother than what you would get from net asset value, which is being impacted by market supply and demand in trading and buying and selling. You don't get that as much, if at all, 
when it comes to dividend production, and there's a little bit of a lagging for dividends to change as they're going along. Is that really the separation and why they matter mathematically? That's part. So you think of when you implement the portfolio waterfall, and you start to let's say you start at a four percent withdrawal rate, and you slowly increase it. What's really interesting is if you use a traditional method, your rate of return goes down with a traditional. Portfolio waterfall, the rate of return actually starts to increase and your volatility starts to decrease. Now, there is a breaking point. Right. Uh, it's around 9% is the breaking point on, on, on all that. But you think of what we're doing is we're increasing cash flow, decreasing risk, and maintaining return. That's the cross, like that. Those, the intersection of those three things, mm-hmm. that is what makes Portfolio Waterfall special. A lot of people just assume that, oh, it's just a dividend strategy. All of our funds are just dividend payers, and that's all we're doing. It's like, no, there's actually only parts of our portfolio, and we have them built in a way where this is where we use the Gestalt method, where if one type, let's say a dividend company, okay, if we want to have the traditional uh, corporate high dividend, high quality well, market goes down, uh, you know, things change. So can we, can we have another type of dividend not tied to corporate profit? Mm-hmm. So now within the last three or four years, there's been some really cool dividend um, type uh, funds that are selling options, 30 day out of the money options to, to collect premium to then transfer into dividends to hand to your client. So we increase volatility we increase dividends. So what you said right there really leads me into probably my favorite question that I got out of the comments from episode 80, and that's going to be to to better prove the portfolio waterfall. Can you select any random four to eight mutual funds, throw them into a traditional method like uh, Monte Carlo simulation model and get some statistics for what are your likelihoods of running out of money? And then apply those same random funds to the portfolio waterfall and show that it outperforms those. Do you think it would work to just select random funds and do that? If so, why or why not? Yeah, so I think it will, but the one thing that will really be the difference maker is is the funds, the random funds you pick, is there no dividends, there's no capital gains, no interest, then it's probably not gonna make too much of a difference. Uh, it'd be more just timing of when you liquidated them. Mm-hmm. But if they, random funds, some are just 100% growth, some have dividends, cap gains, and interest from bonds, and you just randomly pick them. Yes, you will get uh, you know, what we call alpha or you know, more return. It's coming from the structure of how you are structuring those, how cash flows are being received and where incomes are being taken out. That will, that will increase with whatever fund selection you, you pick, okay. as long as those ingredients are there. So as I in a future episode, say randomly pick some to prove it out, as long as I have the qualifier that they do pay a dividend and they are generating capital gains and or interest, I have that as a a filter, I should see an improvement. Yep. That's wonderful. Yeah, there's certain characteristics that we're looking for, and those are the things that if you just did random, you'll you'll get some increase. But then if there's the, the certain pairings of different types of funds, that we're looking for in each allocation, then that's where it really starts to take off. And it's your, your pairing and your selection that really helps beyond just the method itself buffer sequence of returns risk from the client's perspective to, to have something in between that makes them not realize as much statistical risk. It's trying to reduce volatility as much as we can, right? but get the most return. So it's a risk return profile while maintaining cash flows. Okay. And that's what we're really trying to get. So you think of our most aggressive portfolio right now is half the risk of the S&P 500. Whoa. I mean, anyone can risk money. It takes zero skill to risk money. Uh, you know, I always tell clients, I was like, you don't want me, you know, there's zero, but how can we get the return that you need and the cash flow that you need to maintain your, your retirement lifestyle with the least amount of risk, with the least amount of assets? So that's other things. The traditional method, I think that's another thing with advisors is, hey, they make a fee on the whole, all of the assets. So we're going to use all the assets to supply income. 
well, what if I could supply the same amount of income with half as much assets and go do some really, really cool things with the other half? To me, that's way more exciting. And think of the impact that we can have our clients' lives is tremendous. That's cool. Thank you. I'm going to pivot now to some more personal questions. What is your number one career goal? And what sort of measure are you looking for to definitively say, I have achieved that? When I first started, this is a really hard industry to start. I started in 2011. And the first was just to survive. Mm. And then, but then I saw the impact that we're really having in our clients' lives. I mean, most of my clients, I would I consider friends. I have widows that call me of what refrigerator to buy. Oh. I never would ever guessed that at the very beginning. So those are very meaningful things. And then I've had advisors that are part of our producer group where they've doubled or tripled their income and work less and have more time to go spend with their family. Oh, that's wonderful. Uh, those, as long as those things keep happening, I did not create this just to try to become famous or to make as much money as possible. Um, it was very expensive to do this and I had to have a lot of proof of why I should do it and to convince my wife that she should agree to, you know, we're, we're gonna risk everything to go do this. I'm not wired for retirement. I think I'll just keep doing this until people stop wanting something from me and then I'll know. Would it be possible to characterize your success as hitting a point where you're working 100% because you want to and not because you have to and you just keep doing it because you love it? Yeah, I love creating things and share it with other people. Right now we have so much stuff being that we're working on and, and trying to build. It's hard to know like, hey, how do we know when we, when we, you know, we made it? It's like, it keeps moving and I have no idea, but we're just gonna keep going until people don't want it anymore. Because I really think the American dream to me has to be tied to having the ability to have financial independence away from the government. Mm. And unfortunately, our education system does a really poor job of helping people know how things really work. And if people lose the ability to have financial freedom, they, they can't have the American dream. And that's really where I'm passionate with the podcast is helping people grow in financial literacy so they can not only become financially free, that they can have a hope-filled financial future, but they can understand how to get there and understand how beautiful it is when they have. Yeah, I mean, how can you have a good life in all areas if your finances are a wreck? It, it affects every single area of your life. Mm -hmm. I'm also against, it's something we need to know a lot about because why is it the number one topic in the Bible right. is finance. So I think we're supposed to know about this stuff on how it really works. And unfortunately, it's so polarizing. It is. I always tell people, it's like Googling how to invest for retirement is just like saying, is Jesus real? And you're going to get all in, like you're not going to be more educated when you're done. You're going to be so confused. And that's where I really thought, you know, there's a big shift where we're now no longer in the information age. We're in the conceptual age and the job of a financial professional is to be the filter, mm. the filter of all the nonsense that's out there and what, how can I make a concept or a strategy work for you? And it's understandable. That's a financial professional's job. And how to be heard over all the nonsense is there's a lot of noise out there. How do you get your voice heard when there's so much? Yes. Now you said something that's a really nice segue to something that you've shared with me before. You have a different way of thinking about how people believe money works. I believe you call it financial religion. Can, can you share with our listeners a little bit more about that perspective? What is financial religion and how does this way of thinking go? Yeah. I think how this came about was really my upbringing. I grew up in a religious uh, cult-like organization that, you know, I, I eventually escaped when I was in high school. Um, but then when I got into the financial services when I was 29, and I was like, all of the, how it's structured and how people talk is just like how religious cults talk. Hmm. I, I found it fascinating. And that's, I mean, you just want to talk about someone's, you know, financial religion, the thing that's not true is, all right, well, just ask someone, what do you think about the stock market? And they're going to go on like, 
oh, it's, it's horrible. You're going to lose all your money or it's the best thing ever. And you think of, you know, we have this bias, but it's, it's almost religious. The, the, the language is so similar to how we talk about religion that I don't think we should, you know, ignore it. We should learn from it. It's like, all right, so just like religion, what's the core problem that we're all trying to solve? So Christianity is sin. All right. So what's the core problem with financial planning? Time. So build from there. I was like, all right. So what's our doctrines that we're going to follow? What maybe our principles start building those things. And then, then you figure out, all right, well, who, who aligns with that? And a lot of people will take maybe someone like Dave Ramsey and, and just ignore their own thinking and just accept everything. Mm -hmm. And I think that's dangerous that you should build your own financial religion. What's your doctrines you're going to follow? What's your principles that you're going to live, try to live out? And what's your practices and methods? Practices and methods are going to change. Principles and doctrines do not change. That is where you can have a really solid foundation and be able to discern someone talking online about their opinion or from a, a point of truth. Okay, this leads really nicely into what I consider probably the core to my financial religion. And when I started with the financial coaching and stuff, it was with, with uh, writing a personal finance class for teens. And I remember, because it was through my church, we, we had just been talking at church about virtues. I'm like, well, is there a core virtue to personal finance? And in thinking about it, I, I came up with a way of defining hope-filled frugality, the intentional practice of prudent economy. And I've since then used it as the litmus test for all my financial decisions and as the filter for everything I share on the podcast. I try to share it through a lens of frugality. I was really curious if you found the virtue of frugality as I define it compatible with your thinking on not only financial religion, but the Gestalt method. Yeah, I'll be honest with you. The first time I heard you say that, I thought it was a little bit negative because I, I see someone as being frugal as like the miser, the someone that it's almost like the hoarder. Like I'm here to hoard money. Miss Scrooge, the penny yes. pincher. Yes, no fun. You know, it's the motivation behind it. So then I, then I, uh, you know, I was like, there's got to be other ways of like how Jay is thinking about this. So you think of why would I want to save or be, you know, why not just use up all my resources today? Mm -hmm. Well, it's because you have hope for a better future. That's mm -hmm. it. If you don't have hope for something more in the future, then why not use up all your resources today while you have it? If you have that perspective of hope mm -hmm. for something better, then... The other route, and this is where I initially kind of went to, is it's fear. Um, mm. Fear of running out. I have fear of people are going to take things from me. Then that's where I think being frugal is very negative and can really take over someone's life. It's really another form of greed. It's this reverse greed. It's hoarding. Mm -hmm. And But I think the, the side that I see that you're on is, no, you'd want to be frugal today because... You're going to have an amazing future and to not, you know, want to burn up all of your resources because there's more that's going to come. And on the flip side of that, I find that it's also important for people who are natural savers, who organically, without even being able to explain why, want to maintain as much as they can. I think an appropriate measure of frugality can help them let go. So when they can't afford something today, they can do so with emotional permission. Yep. That's something that uh, I've, I've shared about it before. My wife ran into, she's the natural saver and the natural spender. And by implementing this definition of frugality, she's been able to buy things as, as large as a car and not have any buyer's remorse. I think the fastest we've ever bought a car from leaving the house to being back was 45 minutes. And she never had any, any issue with having let that money go. But imagine if you married someone that was wired just like you. Right. And, but what then what if your wife married someone that was just like her? Right. It's like, it'd be a total mess. Either Could way. Be. Could be, yeah. Right. So I, working with now thousands of clients, 
that's something I think it's a God thing of how we are attracted to different people. It's, it's usually a spender and a saver. My wife can go back and forth as changing roles as spenders and savers. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's always, I think it's the help us to stay out of trouble and uh, thank goodness. But it is really interesting is we're usually opposites in that area. There's, there's a balance that I find with couples where they fall on different sides of a half. Saver and spender is a good example. And when they meet in the middle, they end up exercising a plan that works better than we, where either one of them would have been on their own. Yes. And, and I think that leads me to my last question. And I love that marriage came up because I'm very passionate about helping marriages, especially with communication. You mentioned the Bible earlier. I feel like one of the, the coolest things that the Bible says about money is where your treasure lies, there your heart will be also. And I feel strongly that a couple that decides on what they're doing with money together is, is helping their hearts grow together. By putting their treasure in places with priorities that they agree on, they're growing together in all, all areas. Yep. And if they can't agree on where their money is going, their hearts don't have to, but they can grow apart as they follow those different financial priorities. I feel that that is a truth. You've also talked about in this interview how important the pursuit of truth has been. If you have someone who's listening to you right now at the end of this interview, and they are pursuing financial truth, what advice do you have for them on their journey? Yeah, so from my perspective, what helped me was growing up inside of a religious cult mm -hmm. and then figuring out that your whole worldview, what you've been taught was not true. So now you're very mm -hmm. skeptical, which I think that's how, kind of how we started was it's okay to be skeptical, but then what do you do with it? Right. And that's where I love the idea of implementing reasoning from first principles of what are all the parts of this thing, truly understanding it, and then how do I engage with it? And to know that it's not necessarily about math, it's always behavior. Mm. The most successful people that I have as clients did not have the highest income. They were not the best at math, but they had this, this habit of over and over again, they continued to do the right thing. So I think it's also very healthy just to, let's take the stuff apart and put it back together again. How does this work? You know, how does this work with this? That's the other thing is, okay, you have risk over here, but how do you balance that and, mm -hmm. and offset it? But um, stay curious. I think that's one of the things I kind of really worked on this year is we never, ever know it all. And the, the minute that we stop being curious about how something works, the out there's no way for the outcomes to get better. Have you ever read about Thomas Edison's childhood? No. He asked why so much as a child, his teacher called him adult at one point, and his mom pulled him out of school so that he could continue asking why without people trying to squash his curiosity. And it led him to being very successful in what he ended up doing with his life. And I feel like what we need to do in, in response, what I'm inspired to do, is try to avoid the, the influences on me that are squashing my curiosity. Something yeah. that wants to say, don't look into this more, don't learn about this, just keep keep the status quo and keep going. Well, I think what it's why with curiosity mm -hmm. versus why like I'm like you're wrong. Right. Like it's kind of your intent behind it, but truly being curious, not just well, you know, why should I do this? It's not like having a debate with someone like, I'm yeah. going to be right because I'm right. And then arguing about it, it is a common pursuit of truth. You want to go closer to the truth. Yes. And curiosity is the, the locomotive driver behind it. Yep, absolutely. Beautiful. Thank you so much. For, absolutely. This was, this was a lot of fun. We'll have to do it again sometime. Absolutely. Thanks a lot, Jay. Mm -hmm.